Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to CSIS and the Schieffer Series. I'm Beverly Kirk. I direct the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here. And we are pleased to welcome you here if you're in the room and if you're online. Before we get started this evening, we want to thank the sponsor of the Schieffer Series, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. They have supported this series since the very beginning, and we are very grateful for their support. We also want to thank the Texas Christian University, home of the Schieffer College of Communication. They've been a very important partner to this series, and we're grateful for their support as well. Well, tonight's Schieffer Series, you may notice I'm not Andrew Schwartz, who is normally your host for the Schieffer Series, um, but tonight's discussion about 2020 challenges ahead grew out of a Smart Women, Smart Power podcast that I did with the experts you see here on the stage about last year's foreign policy hot topics and what we should expect coming up in 2020. And if you're not already a podcast subscriber, I hope you will be after this. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the Smart Women, Smart Power initiative, uh, we are celebrating our fifth anniversary this year, and we spotlight leaders from around the globe who are experts in foreign policy, national security, international business, and international development. And tonight's panelists are all certainly leaders in that field. And I'm really excited that we have the opportunity tonight to expand on the podcast conversation that we had, because so much has happened in the mere three weeks since we recorded it. <laughs> now, Bob Schieffer, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Beverly. Uh, and Ms. Move the podium. We'll get started. You know, when I was growing up in Fort Worth, we had a saying when an unexpected uh, event happened, and the saying was, who'd have thought it? Actually, it was who to thunk it, but I <laughs> know this is a high-class crowd here, so I'm going to correct the grammar here on, on who to thought it. Uh, and it is my opinion, opinion clearly stated, that we have now entered the who to thought it era of American politics. I mean, who knows uh, what's going to happen next? I, I was talking back in the green room to, to the group here, and I said, you know, it's just, we talk about the 24-hour news cycle, we're in the 10-minute news cycle now. And, and I asked everybody, had they heard some of the late developments of the day? And sure enough, uh, some hadn't. These things are just happening one after the other. There have been major uh, developments today on uh, uh, three different uh, areas. As we were mapping out the uh, contours of this panel, uh, we were talking about developing a program around what are the major policy changes uh, that we're going to face uh, in this new year. And uh, that's when I came up with the, uh, the thought that, well, maybe we've been going through the who'd have thought it uh, exercise again, because who'd have thought that we would have been gathering after the Iraqi army in Baghdad had stood by as anti-American mobs stormed the U.S. Embassy there, or that the Iraqi parliament by now would have uh, passed a resolution to expel U.S. troops from Iraq, or that an American president would say that if the Iraqis did try to expel us, he would put sanctions on the country that we have spent trillions of dollars uh, trying to rebuild? Who would have thought it? Uh, finally, who'd have thought that the killing of one of Iran's top military men uh, would cause millions of Iranians of all political persuasions to pour into the streets by the millions uh, chanting, uh, America must die, and things of that nature. This is in a country where over the last 12 months, there have been 4,000 demonstrations and protests of one kind or another against the Iraqi regime. But here we are. So as we begin today's program, we are going to talk about these various uh, challenges that we'll be facing. But I think we have to begin uh, with uh, talking about uh, these events of the past few days. Uh, if nothing else, our experts here at CSIS are a quite nimble crew, and they can handle anything. So here we go on the challenges that we think are the major challenges today, 
but tomorrow we may want to revise our remarks <laughs> and add some new ones. Kathleen Hicks, uh, who many of you know here, is the Senior Vice President of CBS, holds the Kissinger Chair, Director of our International Security Program. She held key national security positions in the Obama administration. There are full biographies in your programs, but just briefly, Sarah Ladislaw, uh, is Senior Vice President, a uh, Fellow for Energy and National Security Programs. She specializes in energy, global oil, natural gas markets, and climate change. Stephanie Siegel uh, is a CSIS Senior Fellow who holds the assignment chair in political economics. She held senior positions in the U.S. Treasury and at the IMF. She has been in both Republican and Democratic administrations at Treasury. And Beverly Kirk down there, who was our announcer today, uh, sitting in for Andrew Swartz. She heads the CSIS Smart Power, Smart Women's, Politi uh, women's uh, Program. Uh, she is also a former journalist. So, uh, Dr. Hicks, start off, just give us a picture. Your your take on what's happened over these past few days, uh, including uh, what message do you think the president uh, sought to deliver to the American people when he spoke yesterday? Sure, thanks very much for having us, Bob. And yes, we, we try to be very nimble, but the world is challenging <laughs> us at the moment. So let's see how we can do tonight. Um, let me put this first in context, which is the United States and Iran have long been at uh, loggerheads, of course, over the nuclear agreement. People will probably be familiar that uh, President Trump pulled the United States out of the nuclear agreement. The other parties to the agreement have not joined that pullout. Um, and in the midst of that, as part of the explanation for it, uh, President Trump talked about these irregular or terrorist sponsorship approaches that Iran has been doing, in addition to concerns about the agreement itself. That's the backdrop. And sure enough, the Iranians have uh, for years been involved in uh, terrorist, supporting terrorist activities, and their major uh, government vehicle for doing that is the Quds Force called the IRGC, and that is in fact what Soleimani was the head of. So no debate there. Soleimani, bad guy, uh, key mastermind character inside the Iranian regime in terms of supporting these terrorist groups. But what happened in the last week was truly a significant ex escalation, excuse me, of what was already ongoing competition around this terrorist uh, network and proxy warfare. And of course, that was sparked most immediately uh, by the uh, protests around the, uh, the US embassy in Baghdad. Um, and it appears uh, from all reporting that President Trump took in a healthy dose of cable news and was quite upset about the way in which uh, that was portrayed in terms of the Iraqi citizens sort of uh, up in arms um, and the failure to have the Iraqi uh, armed forces protect the embassy. And then the response appeared to be in this immediate sense to use uh, tactical intelligence they had about Soleimani's whereabouts. Okay, so why do I go through all of that? Big issue, I think, first off the bat, is I think they wildly underestimated inside the administration and the very small cohort of people involved how the Iranian people, the Iraqi people, and even the American people would react to this. I think they thought of the Baghdadi before that, the Obama um, killing of, of Osama bin Laden, and then more recently, the ISIS leader Baghdadi killing, and they were not thinking about um, Soleimani as an uh, agent, if you will, or an official, excuse me, of the Iranian government. But that is, in fact, exactly how Iran responded to your point. And in fact, the Iraqis, because this attack took place inside Iraq, Iraq was not consulted, puts the Iraqi government in a very bad position because there are strong pro-Iranian forces within the country. So here we are. The president's statement, I think, uh, yesterday, while it had very unusual Trumpian elements related to things that are more about long-term campaign promises, um, it did really, I think, help to calm down the immediate tensions. Um, and that was, of course, in the aftermath of the rocket attacks that did not uh, cause any fatalities from the Iranians. Um, and so I think that has helped create a little bit of space. 
But I would just caution that, that uh, we are not through this crisis. The very thing I started with, these proxy groups that the Iranians have supporting, that is clearly where they are going next. How this shoot down uh, that appears to be Iranian of the Ukrainian airliner in Tehran plays into that is less clear at this point. It's emergent. But certainly because of the language the Iranians have used, it appears that indirect attacks, proxy attacks, terrorist attacks, such as through Hezbollah, they still consider to be on the table. Um, so I think we need to understand from the administration and do not yet know exactly what that long-term strategy is for the Middle East, of course, in general, but also in terms of U.S.-Iranian policy. So stay tuned. I think you know we're a couple days into something that was already in the middle of a, probably a five-act play, and I'm not even sure which act we're in, but I'm pretty sure we're not at the, at the closing curtain. And also, uh, sort of uh, in keeping with the theme of the who'd have thought it uh, era in, uh, in American foreign policy, this just in, after giving briefings to uh, all of the uh, key members of Congress on Capitol Hill, the intelligence committees, and so on, uh, you remember that Republican Mike uh, Lee of Utah walked out of one and said that this is the single worst briefing I've ever had on anything in all my years in the United States Senate. Uh, the administration was not giving the, the reasons that they said they felt it necessary to, to, to launch this attack. Well, just within the hour, the president in, a, uh, in an appearance uh, in the Oval Office said that he did it because they had information that the, uh, the Iranians were going to blow up the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Now, this is just totally out of the blue. Uh, I'm wondering if, if, in fact, our key intelligence people uh, and, and members of Congress, when this many people get a private briefing on Capitol Hill, the surest bet in town is somebody's going to leak it. And I think if they, had they been told that, I, I think we would have already had unconfirmed reports at the least. Uh, the other uh, new information, of course, is, is the aircraft. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, was this uh, accidental? or was it uh, uh, done on purpose? Uh, the one thing that we know for sure uh, is that the plane, it has been confirmed uh, all across the board that the plane was shot down. It was not an accidental uh, thing that happened there. So at least we, we know that much. Uh, as we're trying to sort this out, Beverly, uh, you, you've given a lot of thought over the past year with your podcast to fake news and, and to manipulation of the news. Uh, do you see that playing into any of this? I mean, I think the reason we have to be so cautious about what we report mm -hmm. is we have to be absolutely certain, those of us in journalism, before we report anything. And that's not always the case that's with other uh, sources of news, as it were. That's very true, and that's a very good point. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, what further information we get about the the shoot down of that plane. But the biggest concern I have for the coming year for 2020 is the all of the misinformation, all of the disinformation that is out there and will surely ramp up as the presidential campaign gets hotter than it already is and people start voting. Uh, and just the the lack of trust that that inspires in, in people to trust anything that they read, even if it's factual, even if it's from a known source of information, a, a credible source of information, but the drip, drip, drip of the disinformation efforts by various malicious actors and the misinformation that you can find very easily in corners of the social media realm, I, I think it just makes it so difficult for people to know exactly what they can believe. And it, it puts the onus on the reader, on the, everybody in this audience, to go and fact check literally everything they read. And as we were talking in the green room, there's just so much information that's so overwhelming. And then you add on top of it, well, there's already a lot of information. Now I've got to go try to verify. It, it just is this drip, drip, drip that causes people not to trust anything, which I think is very detrimental to a democracy. Well, you know, uh, my general take right now is that most people don't believe anything. 
I think you're right. Uh, and uh, I think that was bad last year. And if I were going to make a projection about what's going to happen this year, I think that situation is going to get worse. I don't, because we're now so, uh, Andrew, Hay uh, Andrew Schwartz and I, uh, uh, Andrew Hayward used to be my boss at CBS <laughs> News is why <laughs> I said, but Andrew Schwartz and I in our book 2016, in 2016, which we wrote, uh, about the information overload, which we, we called overload. Uh, you know, the, the great question is, we have in, access to more information than any people who've ever been on Earth at any one time in the history of the world. But we're not wiser. We're not wiser. We're simply overwhelmed with so much information that we can't process it. And that is one of the things that makes this uh, so difficult. Uh, yeah. Sarah, uh, you were going to talk, I know, about climate mm -hmm. and about uh, the problems uh, that we face on climate change. I'd like to read or get, tell you about a, a news Please. bulletin. Again, this just in, within the last hour, the president had a uh, uh, session in the Oval Office uh, where he announced the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the rollback of a series of very major environmental uh, regulations and oddly enough by accident or design he did, he did it while standing in front of a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt yeah. so, who'd have thought it <laughs> <laughs> well you know I mean I do think uh, I take I take very seriously your your point about the who to thunk it sort of cycle that we're in, right? And but but you know I think you know, our job as analysts is to is to make sense out of all of this in some way, shape, or form, even when we're not able to do it in in sort of conventional ways. And I do think that there are patterns, and I'll get to this and how it relates to the Environmental Protection Agency, excuse me, the NEPA, the uh, Environmental Policy Act sort of announcements today, and the broader issue of climate. I tend to think that this administration has some fairly set patterns for how it's acting, both on the domestic regulatory front and with regard to issues of climate change, and also on the foreign policy front. And part of it is about shocking the foreign policy establishment, right? Things that we think are odd are kind of the things they gravitate to. And I think that's by design. Now, I think the thing that I worry about in the case of Iran, just to go back to that for a minute, is I worry that there is a, a strategy of maximum pressure which has affected energy markets in a very big way because you know Iran is a, a large supplier of, of, of oil and that's been uh, their exports have been affected by the Iran sanctions regime. The security in the Middle East, the largest producing oil region and a very significant natural gas producing region of the world is also something that's been at issue with regard to all of this. And all along the line, the, the administration has said, no, we want a maximum pressure campaign to get Iran to do things that if you just look at the list of things, Iran will never do. So what do you do with that? What do you do with a strategy that is designed to to orchestrate the impossible with unconventional means. Well, you know, if you look at the pattern of the administration, they've tended to do this in a lot of things. They wanted to renegotiate NAFTA, we're having a trade war with China, and now we have every indication that the administration will actually settle for much less than what they put out there as their ultimate pledge, right? Their ultimate thing that they want to accomplish in order to sort of declare a victory. But at the same time, so you saw this with USMCA, a trade agreement that is, is good because it's a continuation of NAFTA. It's good because it's not the absence of NAFTA. It's not a vitally new trade arrangement, right? So when you think about this, like if you're the Iranians, how do you deal with that situation? And how do you deal with the fact that even when you think you get a deal with the administration, the next day they might go back and do something that's against your interests again? How do you, and I think this is something the Chinese face that I'm sure Stephanie will sort of talk about. So I actually think we're in this pattern where the world is looking at the United States and saying, geez, this administration has unconventional tactics, unconventional expectations, doesn't seem to honor their word when they make a deal. Alliances don't necessarily mean the same thing. What do we do with these guys? Like, what do we do with the United States in that kind of vantage point? And I think that. I think that that shapes a lot of what 2020 is going to look like. Now, on the environmental side of the equation, it, today's announcement was not a surprise. 
The administration fundamentally believes that the United States has the cleanest record when it comes to the environment and to energy production in the world. And it talked a lot about that quite extensively today, while at the same time narrowed the scope of one of the bedrocks of that very environmental protection of our infrastructure and the way that we, that, that we cite infrastructure in the country. And what's interesting is when you, when you think about it, the, the Obama administration was using those tools and tactics to try and address a much larger global issue, which is climate change. This administration has said time and again that that is not something they regard as a priority. And so when they pull back this regulation, when they talk about the, the, the track record of the United States, there's a disconnect in understanding that you know, the United States doesn't have that environmental track record because we just do. It's because we had laws and regulations it, that worked with private industry to sort of make that apply, make that possible. So in a, in, in the, in, even though it seems sort of surprising in the way in which they say it, the optics around how they you know, sort of talk about it, it is very much in line with the way that they think. The real harm for, a peer, for, for this point in time is it really doesn't address the future. It's a very backward looking, or at very best, you know, looking at today and trying to unleash economic development, approach to thinking about what is a longer term issue, which is how do we change the energy system we have to be able to you know, deal with an issue like yeah. climate change. Stephanie, uh, do you want to uh, add on to anything that you've heard some, so yeah, far? Well, I, I agree, well, I agree with everything that I've heard and just picking up on a couple of the themes that, that Sarah raised this idea of a very uncertain environment. So last year, 2019, was a year where a tax reform had been passed the year prior to that. There was an expectation that because of that tax reform, because of lower tax rates, you were gonna have this big boom in investment, and that was really gonna drive economic growth. And that didn't materialize, and the explanation an explanation for why that didn't materialize was because there was such heightened uncertainty um, there was uncertainty around the direction of trade. Was USMCA going to be renegotiated or agreed to or not? And then what was going to happen with US-China and the trade war? And I think there was the hope that 2020 would be a year that actually addressed a lot of that uncertainty. We're 10 days into it. And <laughs> I think we're seeing that that's not so much the case. We've been talking mostly on the national security side of the equation. but. If you look at the economic side, um, there's an expectation that this first phase deal with China will be signed in the next week or so, and that that would address the uncertainty in the US-China economic relationship. But I think what people are seeing now is we're not clear on the direction for the US-China relationship. And as Sarah was saying, as far as clarity of objective, that's missing entirely. So. If there is a deal, a phase one deal, that's going to address the very narrow set of uncertainty around agricultural purchases and a segment of the tariffs. But the mechanism for enforcement is reportedly tariff-based. Well, uh, you're reading my mind, because okay. that's exactly where I was hoping we would go. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is the, the China uh, trade reps are coming here next week, are they not? Correct. Uh, to, as we're told, they're going to sign the first round. But what is the first round? What, what does that mean? Right. And so this, we have reports of what is actually included in that first phase, phase one agreement. It includes um, additional agricultural purchases on the part of the Chinese. It includes a lowering of a certain segment of the tariffs. It includes reportedly an agreement on currency policies. Um, it doesn't include what really kicked off the tensions to begin with, which is something <coughs> the United States Trade Representative came out with something called a Section 301 report, and it identified policies on the part of China related to tech transfer and a lack of um, respect for intellectual property rights. And those things being very much tied up in technology policies in particular. Those issues, intellectual property protections and tech transfer, those issues are not at the core, at least it's been reported, it's not at the core of what's in the phase one agreement. So the very thing that's been articulated as 
really kind of driving a wedge in the economic relationship between US and China isn't yet addressed. And so now, if phase one is signed, we're gonna be going into a phase two, but there needs to be clarity of objective, and then you have to look at, well, what's the leverage that the United States actually brings to that discussion right now? And if the whole reason for getting to a phase one agreement is to lessen uncertainty and not have to go ahead with continued escalation in tariffs because it's bad for the economy, well, why would that logic then all of a sudden reverse as we go into a phase two negotiation? Kath is probably better equipped to talk about strategically kind of the US-China relationship, but I think we're talking narrowly about the economic piece of it, but the geostrategic relationship between US-China, that is something that has to be part of the conversation it's not clear when you're just talking about this trade war where that's fitting in, and it absolutely needs to fit in, and hopefully the administration is actually thinking in those broad strategic terms, but we haven't really seen evidence of that. So, Kath, that seems like the cue yeah, to it does. you. <laughs> right, and I, you know, I just uh, tying the Iran piece to this, it was, um, uh, it was difficult as, as an American foreign policy analyst to see the Iran excuse me, the Chinese quickly have a message out that urged calm and de-escalation on both sides yeah. between the United States and Iran, equating the United States and Iran. And so China yet again has an opportunity to show itself as a potential great power that um, has a more rational and, and manageable approach to world affairs and urges peace. I mean, just sort of think about that going back in time. That used to be sort of the role that the United States would play. Um, and I do think this issue of the U.S.-China relationship is for those inside the community of foreign policy analysts the big issue, right? It's been there, but it, it, the, this administration in its rhetoric, it, meaning its strategic rhetoric, its documentation, the words out of the Secretary of Defense, uh, both uh, Secretary Mattis and now Secretary Esper, have been around this issue of the centrality of the U.S.-China challenge. Uh, the reality, however, is that we are focused increasingly as we ever have been on issues beyond that, outside of that, and not able really ever to get to the big decisions that have to be made around U.S. and China, and, and a huge piece of that is the economic. What, what is it that we want in the end? Do we want to indeed have China be party to a, an international economic system, um, but we failed in our tactics in the past? Is that where we think we are? Or do we actually believe there should be bifurcation of some kind, and is that even a possibility? So bifurcation, in other words, akin to, although, not exactly the same as the U.S.-Soviet realm, where you'd have a U.S.-led system and a China-led economic system. That, I have no idea how that's even a possibility, but there is discussion still ongoing in that direction. So we don't even know where end state is with U.S.-China policy. On the defense side, it's a huge issue because China is the major pacing challenge, and of course, defense takes the majority, or 50%, I should say, of discretionary dollars that we put in as taxpayers, and so people want to know what that's going toward. And we've been trying to drive in the defense community toward strong capabilities that could pace the China in particular challenge. And we're really struggling with that right now because there are so many other demands, for example, in the Middle East, but also, of course, in Europe where we're trying to deter Russia and other things. Very challenging issue in this coming year. I'm going to just pivot from that to say, I think if I were to tie a lot of these themes together and say what really worries me in 2020 is that we used to talk, I'm sure, too optimistically about politics stopping at the water's edge and foreign policy at least being a place where we had an illusion, if nothing else, of rationality in terms of our how we think about US interests and how we apply them. I think that's totally gone. My big concern for 2020 is that the, camp, the domestic campaign over the presidency is so intense and the president's own actions to date have demonstrated that he does not see that line. And again, I'll say this uh, speech he gave yesterday went from a de-escalation with Iran to immediately into a set of um, campaign promises, essentially, or, or long-term rhetoric that was more political in nature that he was trying to fulfill. And I think it'll happen, if you will, on the other side as well, as, as, uh, as Democrats um, also are, are trying to you know, gain the presidency. 
This is really challenging because it means the way the U.S. reacts is going to be much more gut. It is going to be much more about how does it play at home. Um, and that's very hard for our allies and partners abroad. And frankly, it can create some opportunities for those who might want to subvert U.S. interests in this period of chaos. China is an excellent example of a calm, long-term thinking actor that if it doesn't trip over any uh, thresholds of violence, um, probably can continue to gain some advantages in this year as we're really looking inward. You know, I, I couldn't agree with more with your point, especially about uh, partisanship ending uh, at, the, at the water's edges. And being much older than anyone on this panel, <laughs> I can remember back when that really was the, the prevailing feeling that we all argued with each other, but boy, we, when we went to a foreign country, no U.S. official, no reporter really, said anything uh, bad or negative about the folks back home or, or about America. And I couldn't agree more that it's all changed. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of polling anymore. I used to be, because it is so difficult now to do. You know, for example, when we used to at CBS do a, a national poll, uh, we had a sample of 1,500 people. To get uh, 1,500 people, we would generally have to talk to 3,000 people. To get 1,500 people now, we have to talk to 30,000 people. And I don't care how you break it down, when you have to talk to that many people to get that few, that uh, people, number of people that you can trust, you still have to wonder who are these people that still answer their phone. I mean, would anyone on this panel talk to anyone on the telephone that you don't know? No. I don't even do that at the office. Right. <laughs> you know, because you just never know uh, what's going on out there. And, and we all have to be wary about that. And, and Beverly, to, to the point you were making about this just distrust of institutions, uh, I started out saying I'm not much of a fan of polling anymore. But the organization I really respect is the Pew Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I saw a thing today, they did a worldwide poll. I don't know if there's such a thing, but they polled in 33 countries. And they found that 64% of those uh, questioned thought the president would not necessarily do the right thing in time of a crisis. He ranked apparently in credibility uh, behind Putin. Uh, and uh, I guess, and, uh, and somebody else, I can't even remember now uh, who it was, but he, did, he didn't top the list of, of people to be trusted. I, I, I give no endorsement of this poll. I just simply, it's something that's been published and I read it, but I think it plays very much to your point and, and, and also to what, uh, what Kath is saying here. Well, we're in a different place right now, and I think the most dangerous part of it, in, in my view, is that our allies and our enemies are not certain what we would do in a time of crisis. And to me, that's the most dangerous place that the United States has been in in a long, long time. What I find really interesting is that I once did answer the phone and uh, it was a pollster on the other line. It was the first time and last time I've ever been called like that. And I, I did answer the question, but I was a little nervous about it. And then I wondered, who was doing the poll because that wasn't clear and there were lots of push questions to get you to say yes or no you agreed with x y or z and uh and again i never did it again but I, that lack of trust makes it so difficult to really read the temperature of this country and people around the world or maybe people around the world are more trusting in order for a pollster to get a result that says 60, what was it, 64 percent didn't think the president would uh, make the right decision in a crisis. But uh, the the challenge I think that we face with information, it, it's it's bigger than than what we think in terms of when we turn on a TV and watch the news. For those of us who still do that, or if you pick up your phone and you and you uh, and you read information, I, I think the really dangerous thing for it is just. What happens when, as you said, nobody believes anything and that begins to permeate when people in government and in institutions provide information that's critical and people are like, well, I don't know if I can believe that. Uh, you know, how does a society survive 
And but that's where we are, and that's what we're dealing with. Stephanie, uh, another part of national security is the state of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you describe the state of our economy now? The market keeps going up, unemployment keeps going down, <coughs> but I also know that the deficit keeps going up, right. and I also know that the, uh, the national debt right. keeps increasing. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the answer to that question depends. So if we look kind of at the headline news coming out of the economy, as you said, I mean, growth is around 2% per year. Um, we've been in one of the longest expansionary cycles um, in history. Unemployment is at record lows. Wage growth has actually been picking up. So in many respects, and the market is doing incredibly well, um, in many respects, the economy is doing quite well. Um, I think uh, then if you start to look more at the micro data, is that strong economy actually performing well for everyone? And there I think you get a very different result. And actually going back to something that Kath said as far as China maybe taking advantage of where things are not going well, one of the things that we heard in talking with Chinese scholars, there's a conviction in China that the reason the US is being so antagonistic toward China is because of uh, a lack of um, opportunity here at home. So we're looking abroad basically to kind of deflect from things that are not necessarily working. I don't think that that's true. I think the United States actually has very real reasons to be concerned with China, so it's a separate issue. But I think what they're pointing to, this notion that the economy is not working for everyone, is absolutely true. And I think we're seeing now how that plays in our own domestic politics. Um, and I think you're seeing maybe a greater polarization because of the fact that things are not necessarily working and there are not really good middle solutions, or at least that's really not where the politics is taking us right now. I think we're kind of getting increasingly polarized, and part of that is looking for a solution to the perception that the economy is not working for everybody. Sarah, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think it's a really good set of points, because I, you know, from my vantage point, the one to add some uh, attempts at positivity for the year ahead. Uh, the one bipartisan thing I think that is that that I see and feel and hear is 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 organized around fear of U.S. competition vis-a-vis -vis China. Right? I think Democrats and Republicans of 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 a wide variety are all very concerned about the U.S. place in the world vis-a-vis -vis China in particular. And, and, you know, in this day and age, to have anything that we're either both afraid of or, you know, all, we're, we can all agree we need to sort of deal with together is an opportunity. Now, whether we're doing the right thing, you know, to, to execute on some of those concerns with regard to competitive pressure vis-a-vis -vis China is, is probably, I, I'm not sure we are yet, but I do think that one of the biggest changes over the last several years has been we went from this place where we really did think we had some productive partnerships with China, we were still sort of bringing them along into a global order, we were having some areas where there, was a, there were increasing amounts of problems, but it just like switched, uh, a light switched, right? And, and now you barely hear anybody talking about, you know, really productive areas of future building in terms of um, political or economic structures or even in terms of climate change where I deal with, you know, there is no world, zero world, where we actually tackle the issue of climate change and China's not involved. It doesn't exist. So we have to work with them. We're going to have to figure that out. And that was a really positive element of the Obama administration. Now everybody's sort of like, geez, how's that gonna work? Are we gonna decouple from them? How are we gonna organize the world where the United States and China don't get along? I really actually think that there is an opportunity for people to say, you know, if we're really worried about competing with China, why don't we try to be more competitive? Like, why don't we try upping our game a bit? I know we like to do the whack-a-mole version of foreign policy, but they are a very big mole. And you need a very big mallet, and we don't have that anymore. So we should probably start thinking about how we're going to try and compete better. I want to go uh, to the audience, but before we do, uh, while you're thinking of your questions, I, I want to go uh, back to Dr. Hicks. The one thing we haven't talked about, and I think we ought to at least mention, is North Korea. Mm -hmm. Where are we on that? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, I don't think we know. The North Koreans had promised a Christmas surprise. Um, I think we're still waiting on that. Uh, but that's, you know, next Christmas. maybe they met next time. Maybe we made our own New Year's surprise. Um, but there has been this attempt under the Iranian umbrella for some parallelism just in the last day with the U.S. approach on North Korea. Uh, but that approach hasn't borne fruit yet, right? So here we have a North Korea that is steadily progressing both in terms of its missile capabilities, still has all the same conventional capability it ever did, and is making some progress toward nuclear capability. And the U.S. has, has said, you know, we, we, we want to engage in conversations with you, want to engage in this dialogue. It has not worked. So uh, with John Bolton having left, who obviously was very hard over on North Korea's strategy, I'm not sure what the voices in the administration are right now that are strong one way or another on North Korea because Pompeo cares more about Iran. So there's a big shift in focus on Iran policy. So for now, I think North Korea, North Korea policy in general is on a back burner. North Koreans are advancing their capabilities. Um, president still from time to time talks about pulling U.S. troops out of South Korea. And in fact, we are still in the middle of negotiations with the South Koreans on um, the, the agreement under which they provide support, which they do provide to U.S. military personnel. So the president has been more focused on trying to get, extract more money out of the South Koreans for that. The big question for 2020 becomes, does the Kim regime, in fact, make um, step change improvements in its capability um, that are truly worrisome, either in terms of range or in terms of the marrying of nuclear and missile capability? Or and or is there some new normal in the diplomatic realm that gives us any hope of change? Much as the description I think that um, Sarah had about uh, you know what is it we want? What are the Iranians willing to do? It, there is no reason to think the North Koreans are ever going to give up this regime on their quest for nuclear capability, um, and they have repeatedly shown that they are willing to uh, uh, negotiate in bad faith over that. Um, so it's a really hard position for the administration to be in, and I honestly think their hope will be to keep it on the back burner, which in, with a very different set of dynamics, actually the Obama administration at the very end also was sort of hoping that North Korea could just hold tight through the end of the administration. Uh, the Trump administration's going to have to get, you know, they got, a, they got a longer period of time to go here in 2020 to try the same strategy. One thing I did forget, and I do want to mention, uh, does anyone on the panel think that President Trump is going to be removed uh, during the impeachment proceedings, which are sure to come? I don't. No. Does anyone else think so? Okay, so I don't think we need to talk. <laughs> All right, right here. <laughs> and hold the microphone close. You're dealing with, dealing with an old fellow here who doesn't hear as well as he used to. So. My name is Walter Jurassic. I'm a member of Polish American Congress. And uh, the, what I ask, ask and a question as well as a comment, short comment, uh, why don't the politicians build the bridges between the people? And I, n why not? Because the bridge for their bridges don't make any money. And that's only comment. And the other, other situation is, all this, what I hear it, is base of academia. I'm I, an engineer I, background, I'm and I say sorry, that, why don't we look for solution? I, I'm not understanding your question. Can anyone on the panel help me here? No, not a question. Now, why the politicians? Well, if it's not a question, yeah. then yeah. don't build the bridges between the people and culture. But we're, we're here to like answer questions. Bridges. bridges. How about this because language? they don't make any Thank money. Thank you very much. I think I got it. You got it. He was Isn't just asking why politicians don't spend more time trying to build bridges, like cultural bridges between people. I think that's an excellent idea yeah. uh, to give you the answer. And I'm not sure why they don't, but uh, we're in a very, very difficult votes. and very partisan uh, time in American history here. That's the best answer I can give you. This lady. Yeah. Oh, the and microphone's coming. Microphone's coming. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I'm Dr. Elaine Sorreo. I'm Associate Rector of UACU in Kiev, Ukraine. I live and work, though, here in D.C. Uh, I really do appreciate the points made from each of you and how they interject, inter interlock, and 
bring about, and they bring to me, from my personal feelings, a great frustration. I feel like I'm being held hostage <laughs> in my own country. I, I have all the information, as you pointed out, Mr. Schieffer. We have more information than we could possibly, even possibly, remotely digest. I, I, professionally, I sort through volumes of it on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, there's only so much that I can connect and feel like, all right, if I bring this point together and this point together and this point together, we could have a solution. Because in the next 30 minutes, that will do 180 degrees out of the clear blue sky, making no relationship to any of the concrete issues at stake. Where do we go? The point is, where do we go when you feel like you're held hostage? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in and just say, I do think kind of maybe going back to the, the attempted optimism from Sarah that we've already forgotten. Uh, there, I think there is a lot of a continuing opportunity for the people to people piece of this. And I'm sure you do a lot of that yourselves. I talk to a lot of um, representatives of allied countries and partner countries. Um, and so on the overseas piece of it, the foreign policy piece of it, there's still a lot of bridges to build and those pay off in the long term. We, we are definitely not just the United States, but uh, throughout the world in a period of significant transition, the end point of which is not clear and never really has an end point. But we're, we're clearly in a period of paradigm shift. I mean, there's, that just is where we are internationally at the moment and, sen and then there's the domestic piece. And let me just end on that by saying domestically, I do think Americans have a responsibility individually to try to build those bridges. Uh, you happen to be sitting in an institution that may seem to some archaic because we are dedicated to that idea that um, in a civil society like the United States, we are better off trying to work on things um, by and large together and build bridges. Um, and so we have to do that every day. I think Americans um, have that capacity by and large. Every individual American can find ways to do that. They volunteer in their own communities. Um, they, they, whether they worship with their neighbors or they're saying hello to them in the grocery store or whatever it is, I think that's where we start to build back and feel a sense of control. We can't control, you're right, we can't control the series of events that seem like they're just rolling forward. Um, and it's very disconcerting, uh, but there are things we can do. Beverly, why don't you add on to that? I, one thing that I think that we all have to do is we have to be not afraid to step out of our bubble and get to know people who do not look like us, do not agree with us, come from different places, and that's hard to do. That's absolutely positively hard and painful to do, but unless we do that, and social media, back to the online thing, um, has, I think, made that a little bit more difficult to do. We get in our bubbles and we get in the conversation with everybody who thinks like us and is just like us, and we forget to reach out and, and get to know people who are different. And I think that will help us build a healthier democracy. It sounds really simplistic, but I think that's one of the answers. And, and I would just add on to that uh, as a journalist. Uh, Somebody asked Marty uh, Barron, the uh, editor of the uh, of Washington Post, when uh, journalists were being called enemies of the American people, when they were being called the opposition party, they said to Marty, well, what do you think you should do? He said, I think we should just do our job as journalists. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all have to remember. Uh, don't give up, number one. Don't let them get you down. <laughs> and just keep at it. How about over there, this lady back? Yes. Sorry. Here comes Sorry. the mic. Thank you. By the way, thank you so much. So I know you have been preparing for this program long before five days ago. And so I, my question is, if you had the top two challenges, as this topic says, for 2020, what were they and have they changed? or have we even talked about them this evening? I'll jump in and 
I'll jump in with one. I, I mentioned one of the challenges I think is disinformation and misinformation, but another challenge that I want to piggyback on something that Stephanie said about the economy. Um, I have yet to hear a coherent conversation about what's going on in rural America. I'm a sixth generation product of rural America, and I was just there over the holiday season, and the outlook there is a 180 degree turn from what the outlook is here. And the fact that we don't have that conversation is disturbing and it's creating another divide within this country between people who live in rural areas and people who live in cities. And if we're not talking about how to solve some of the problems of the people who are left out of the economy that's doing well, we're doing a disservice. And I think that challenge is going to continue to grow and it's one that presents a security issue if we don't deal with it and deal with it fairly quickly. Yeah, I'm related to that, one of my big concerns is the increasing polarization that you're seeing in the country right now and the fact that there really isn't room in the middle to come up with solutions that may not be kind of your first choice, but they're acceptable to the majority of Americans. I think that's a huge problem. I think part of it relates to the disparities that Bev was just talking about. The second thing that I worry about is, so I don't think you can predict crisis kind of by nature, they're unpredictable. I do worry about what is our crisis response, what is our capacity to respond to crisis right now, and do we have kind of the, the machinery in place to coordinate a response in a way that is thoughtful and appreciates fully uh, the multi-dimensional nature of the world. Um, and I don't feel like we're in the best position right now to do that. So I think those are all really good. I, I'll add two super duper gloomy ones. Uh, <laughs> uh, climate change is a is a, a increasingly sort of things that people are uh, more and more people are engaged in actually thinking about the urgency of dealing with this 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 challenge. 2020, for a whole bunch of complicated reasons that we can't get into tonight, is a pivot point, right? It's, it's either we made some progress a few years ago and we sort of take a pause from it because of the lack of US leadership, or we're going to sort of definitively turn away from it at a broad political uh, process, at a lot broad political level, for a period of time. And so I really think the outcome of the US election is gonna be a really big turning point in how we choose to continue to deal with that issue. The second one that I really worry about, like if you really wanna know what I worry about, I worry about the outcome of the election being contested. Yes. We have talked for four years about manipulation in the last election cycle. We haven't solved that problem and we're still just fighting with each other. It, our, it's like fighting over chairs on the Titanic. You know, it's like we're going to have to make sure that the democracy is healthy and that we can continue to have a turn, like we can have civil discourse about our processes. That sounds alarmist, right? But the last four years have been a, a sort of a continuation of surprise. For me, the surprise is, and I'll be bipartisan about this, we're choosing party over country on everything, just on everything. And there's so much money in the elections and there's so much time and effort put into arguing with each other. It's, I really worry that we haven't prepared for what that election cycle could be. I hope to hell that I'm wrong. Well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right though because we have reached the point here where when potholes and repairing them has become a political issue, I mean, how, how much lower can you go on the, on the partisanship scale? One more question out here. I'm gonna ask this fellow right here. Um, Justice Alzona. Hello. Hello. You're good. Uh, is this on? How you yeah, doing? I'm not sure it is. room here just over four years ago in 2015 in this very room here just over four years ago in 2015 you were sitting right over there and I was sitting right over here Henry Kissinger had in his wisdom had addressed this audience and he mentioned two things and this is the Middle East and and the East or Russia mentioned two things uh, then that was the same thing where by the way uh, John Brennan gave the keynote speech you remember that yeah I remember Okay, he, he mentioned two things to the distinguished audience here. Um, 
that, number one, that we need to prepare for a post-Putin Russia. Number two, that we need to, they were designing all the geniuses here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're speaking about redrawing the borders of the Middle East. Um, I remember Ambassador Pickerington and some others, and there yep. were people from all over the world who were, who, who were in here. So I just was wondering what your th thoughts on that. I know just over four years seems like almost uh, a millennial ago in terms of foreign policy, but where do, you, uh, where do you think it is right now, and what do you think of the prospect, at least of Henry Kissinger's vision of a post-Putin Russia, and number two, of the redrawing of the borders of the Middle East? Well, I guess the thing that uh, Dr. Kissinger didn't attach to that was a timetable. So <laughs> <laughs> that may still be in progress, but if it is, I, I'm not sure I see it, see it very clearly out there on the horizon. This has been a wonderful uh, session. I want to thank you all for your very sharp attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>